During the scramble for Africa, European imperialist powers claimed for themselves territories in Africa and established new administrations within them. This altered the trajectory of African history in that pre-colonial economies, social organizations and political structures were changed in the process. But contact between Africa and Europe had not just begun with colonialism. European merchants engaged with pre-colonial African societies in trade and missionaries also developed spheres of religious influence among these societies long before the Berlin Conference formalized the colonization of the continent. The transatlantic slave trade had been the biggest form of trade between Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa for close to 400 years. However, in the early 1800s, the external slave trade was abolished and replaced with what was termed legitimate commerce, and it focused on raw materials trade. This shift was caused by industrial developments in Europe, which needed African raw materials. From the late 1800s to the early 1900s, European powers made their dealings with African societies exclusive, and this was done through colonization. But the experience of colonial rule would reinvent African societies in many ways. To understand these, it is important to look at three areas, namely the colonial state, the economy, and social change. For the British, indirect rule was the most suitable colonial policy for the administration of African colonies. The policy was developed by British colonial administrator Frederick Lugard in northern Nigeria. Indirect rule was a cheap way of administering colonies because it involved the use of pre-existing African power structures like chiefs as middlemen in the administration of their people. In northern Nigeria, where Lugard experimented with indirect rule, it succeeded because there were already Muslim emirs who were used to collect tax and administer the territory on behalf of the British. Similarly, indirect rule succeeded in the Kingdom of Buganda in East Africa, where there was already a central authority through which the British could control the Africans. In southeastern Nigeria, indirect rule was not as successful, especially among the Igbo people who did not have central authorities like chiefs. The British appointed local people as chiefs and gave them powers that were alien to the traditional political setting. The Igbo people refused to cooperate with these warrant chiefs and this undermined the policy of indirect rule. The French colonial state in contrast to the British one, was administered through the policy of direct rule. Assimilated Africans who were considered civilized became citizens of France and could vote in French elections. A few of them were even elected to the French National Assembly. Most Africans who were not assimilated, however, remained subjects of France with no rights and usually subjected to forced labor. French colonial states had more unified chains of command that extended from the governor down to the village in one hierarchy. This, however, was what the policy of direct rule represented in theory. The reality of the French colonial state in most areas was no different from that of the British state. The cost of implementing a system of direct control coupled with the lack of cooperation from Africans, impeded full-scale assimilation. Belgium's approach was inspired by both British and French doctrines. Belgian colonial agents used African leaders who had legitimacy in the eyes of their people and helped the colonial government achieve its goals. 
This approach was evident in the mandated territories of Rwanda and Urundi, both of which had long histories as centralized kingdoms, while in the vast Congo it was more challenging because of political fragmentation. The challenge in the Congo was, however, remedied by amalgamating smaller jurisdictions. The Portuguese colonial state, on the other hand, reflected Portugal's weakness at the time of the scramble for Africa. Portuguese colonies like Mozambique, Angola, and Guinea-Bissau were considered as Portuguese overseas provinces, and an elaborate network of intermediaries was never set up by the colonizers. However, large parts of the Portuguese territories and the Belgian Congo were rented out to concessionary companies. In the 1920s and 1930s, during Mussolini's time in power, the Italian colonial state reflected the fascist doctrines of his regime. In Libya, Eritrea and Somalia, there was a constant exaltation of the Italian state as well as a rigid territorial administration reflective of Mussolini's doctrine. Another crucial component of the colonial state was security forces. Colonial forces, whether police or military, were important in the creation of a new state structure and legal system through the collection of tax, appropriation of land, and extraction of labor. The colonial police in Nigeria, for example, emerged as an agent of the state's capitalist order in the exploitation of the colony and its inhabitants. It also subjected Nigerians to forced labor and inhumane working conditions. In German East Africa, the African soldiers, who were known as the Askari, traveled from place to place conducting various duties on behalf of the colonial state. Some of these duties were the collection of tax from the colonial intermediaries like chiefs, as well as facilitating forums for public deliberations on issues of colonial administration. Furthermore, as agents of the state, the Askari maintained a visible omnipresence in German East Africa. Colonial rule had a profound impact on African economic development. In his book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, Guyanese historian and political activist Walter Rodney argued that colonialism was not just a system of exploitation, but that its objective was to repatriate profits to the colonizing country. The result of this was a dialectical process in which Europe was becoming developed while Africa was being underdeveloped. Rodney stated that the colonial administration became an economic exploiter, playing the lead role in expatriating African surplus to Europe and imposing taxes on Africans as a way of incorporating them into the money economy. In West Africa and parts of East Africa where much land was still in the hands of the Africans, they developed a peasant statist economy where Africans were forced to grow cash crops. These regions became a source of cheap raw materials and the colonial state determined the type of commodities to be produced as well as their prices. In British West Africa, cocoa and groundnuts became the main cash crops, while in East Africa, particularly Uganda, it was cotton. For French West Africa, the main export was palm oil and peanuts. In Southern Africa and in Kenya, there was a settler economy, largely organized around agriculture and dependent upon African labor. Here, agriculture was controlled by the white minority settlers who appropriated land from the majority Africans. The settler economy of Southern Africa also involved mining, which just like the settler agriculture, was dependent upon African labor. When Southern Rhodesia, which is now Zimbabwe, changed from company rule to responsible government in 1923, many policies were implemented to limit African economic potential. The Land Apportionment Act of 1930 is an example of such policies. The Land Apportionment Act also led to separate purchase lands for Africans and Europeans, 
and the establishment of what was called native purchase areas. These native purchase areas, however, represented a small portion of land in southern Rhodesia, which meant that without agricultural land to produce cash crops, Africans would be forced to go into low-paid wage labor. In South Africa, the white minority government also undermined African economic growth, especially in agriculture and land ownership. Initially, black agriculturalists had been successful in engaging in the capitalist economy. However, an independent African peasantry threatened the labor supplies needed by the mining industries and competed with the white farmers for markets. To undermine this African peasantry, the growing mineral industry and the capitalist economy were used to restructure the relationships of the peasantry with the white settlers. The white minority union government, which was created in 1910, used its political powers to pass laws that undercut the African peasantry. An example of such laws was the 1913 Native Land Act which allocated only 7% of arable land to Africans while reserving the rest of the land for the white minority. Although the appropriation of African land went as far back as the 1800s, the impact of the 1913 Land Act continued into the 1920s and 1930s. Colonial rule reinvented African societies as far as religion is concerned. European missionaries converted some Africans from their traditional religions into Christianity and they also established schools in Africa. It is important to understand though that some African societies converted to Christianity not because of faith but because they thought the religion could provide them with opportunities for improved social mobility. During German rule in Rwanda, for example, in the early 1900s, the Tutsi realized that Christianity and Western education were sources of prestige and authority, and many of them converted and eventually were ordained as priests. During the 19th century, Mission Christianity was very successful in southern Nigeria, and through the provision of Western education and the cultivation of a European culture, it brought about a new African elite in that region. Despite the success of Mission Christianity in the South, the reality was different in Northern Nigeria, which was predominantly Muslim. The British administration of Northern Nigeria took a decidedly anti-missionary stance, especially at the turn of the 20th century. After 1906, mission activities in the North were limited, and the colonial administration rejected every application by the Christian Mission Society to establish missions there. Allowing the advancement of Christian missions in the North would have antagonized the Muslim traditional leaders, which would have in turn compromised the efficiency of indirect rule. During the colonial period, there also emerged new religious movements that came to be known as African independent churches. Some of these churches were a result of Africans' inability to reconcile their traditional beliefs with the teachings of Christianity and were therefore created to embrace both Christianity and African traditionalism. African independent churches have been generally divided into two types, namely the Ethiopian and the Zionist. The Ethiopian type of African independent churches are churches that seceded from mission churches mainly to escape white control as they believed that religion was an area of political independence. The Zionist types of African independent churches did not develop from mission churches but were formed from scratch. These churches were characterized by speaking in tongues, religious charisma, emotionalism, and a strong aversion to Western education and medicine. 
Colonial rule also reinvented African societies through the development of urban settlements from which westernized African elites as well as urban workers emerged. In southern Rhodesia, for example, there emerged an African middle class educated by missionaries which began to threaten the settler-dominated status quo. This emerging class in southern Rhodesia was rather selfish in its quest for Western ideals as it mainly agitated for equal rights with the white settlers and often cared little for the African masses. In colonial cities like Brazzaville, there also developed a society that embraced leisure, sports, Western music and fashion. Leisure activities and institutions had different meanings for different people. While some Africans were often too drained by the long hours of work and used their leisure time for drinking, many took the opportunities to incorporate these leisure activities and institutions into their own urban environment as areas of autonomous cultural activity. Women's experiences during colonial rule also reflected the social change in African societies. With the development of urban settlements, women's roles also changed as they sought to adjust to the economic changes brought upon their families by colonial rule. In Kenya, for example, Nairobi had a large population of migrant workers and this attracted prostitutes. In some cases, however, prostitution emerged as a way out for some of the pastoral and peasant households who had had very little fortune in the agricultural economy. The emergence of towns, mining cities, mission stations and European farms also presented women with avenues to escape what they saw as restrictive lives imposed upon them by rural patriarchal authority. By the middle of the 20th century, Colonialism had resulted in various transformations of African societies. Different colonial economies had been developed to efficiently extract and export African wealth to Europe. Taxation was imposed on African societies to force them into the cash economy, which they were hitherto unfamiliar with. Africans who were still in possession of their land produced cash crops which were exported to Europe. In areas where Africans were dispossessed of their land, they had no choice but to engage in low-paid wage labor in European farms and mines. The development of new urban settlements also led to the emergence of westernized African elites, urban workers, and new social institutions such as sports, music bands, and other leisure activities. We hope that you've enjoyed this episode and that you will stay tuned for the next one. This has been Simon Bayani with Africa in Retrospect. Cheers for now.